Good morning. I'm showing 9 o'clock on my, uh, my clock here, so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Mike DeLaCluse. I'm the president of Lesson Instrument Company. I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for today's webinar, Back Pressure Regulators 101. In today's webinar, we will cover definitions and types of back pressure regulating valves, principles of operation, sizing and selection tips, and a few application success stories and examples. At the end, we'll go over all your questions, so uh, please save them up and put them into the uh, question tool at the end. We are fortunate to have two very knowledgeable presenters today, Harry Wepkenberg and Lyle Hamilton from Richards Industries. Richards Industries is the parent company of Jordan Valves, as well as brands that include Low Flow Control Valves, Marwin Valves, Hex Valves, Steroflow, and Bestabel steam traps. Harry is the Vice President of Marketing for Jordan Valves. He's been in the valve industry for 14 years, the last eight years with Jordan. He currently holds the record for the largest viewing audience of a Lessman webinar with over 47,000 views for Regulators 101, which can be viewed on the Lessman channel uh, on YouTube. Our other presenter, Lyle Hamilton, is a 20-year veteran of Richards Industries and is a key member of the engineering team. His responsibilities include new product development and technical support for the Jordan and Steriflow product lines. Because of the large number of attendees today, we will be muting the phone lines. If you do have questions, there is a question tool in the GoToMeeting menu. Please type your question into the tool and we'll make sure that they get answered at the end. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Harry and Lyle. Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank, obviously, Mike and his team at Lessman for hosting Back Pressure Regulators 101, and of course, all of you for attending our seminar this morning. I'm Harry Wepkenberg, and uh, with me this morning is Lyle Hamilton, our senior Jordan Valve project engineer. The presentation will last uh, roughly 25 to 30 minutes, at which time we'll open it up for any questions you might have. So let's go ahead and get started with Back Pressure Regulators 101. We're going to do it to you again. For those of you that uh, attended Regulators 101, we're going to start a regulator discussion by talking about a control loop. Um, in the control loop, the process variable is continually measured. The value of the variable is compared to the set point in the controller. The controller can be anything from a standalone controller in a control room to a computer card in one of the components in a distributed control system or DCS. A corrective signal, which is an error signal, is sent to the final controller. In this case, the control valve is the final control element to correct any departure from the set point. It's basically negative feedback control. That is, the system and the control work to oppose any change from the set point. The measured variable and the controlled variable are not necessarily in the same fluid system. As illustrated in the previous slide, there are three major elements in a control loop. First, you have the sensing element. The sensing element measures the process variable being controlled and sends an output to the controlling instrument. The controlling instrument calculates the error, which is defined as the difference in signal from the sensing element and the desired set point and sends a corrective signal to the final control element. And the final control element, uh, in this case again the control valve, varies the flow to change the controlled variable to the required set point. Here you see uh, a cutaway version of a back pressure regulating valve. Uh, you'll hear me oftentimes refer to it as BPRV because it's a, a whole lot less to say than back pressure regulator. But you can see some of the some of the important components 
um, that are going to allow the back pressure regulator to do its job. Um, from top to bottom, there's an adjustment screw. You can see the cutaway of the spring, the diaphragm, and the valve plug. Um, how this relates to the uh, control loop that we looked at two slides prior, the adjustment screw is actually your set point adjustment. Um, if you rotate it to the right, it compresses the spring and therefore is going to raise your set point. If you rotate it to the left, it will uh, relax the spring and lower your set point. The spring in this case acts as the controller. Um, the diaphragm is the sensing element and this measures uh, the process variable and um, sends an output to the controlling instrument again which is the spring and then the spring will calculate the error and send a corrective signal to the final control element. Then the final control element in this case is the valve plug which will vary the flow to change the controlled variable to the desired set point. So basically you have uh, in, a, in a back pressure regulating valve, just as the case in a pressure regulating valve, it is a, a self-contained proportional controller. Back pressure regulators or BPRVs are designed to modulate to hold a specific back pressure. It's important to note that these are not a safety relief valve. Even though they perform a relief function in a variety of applications, they're not a safety relief valve. Um, it can be uh, modulate back pressure to sustain or hold the specific back pressure. Um, you can use it for bypass pressure control or again um, to relieve pressure. Uh, BPRVs monitor and regulate upstream pressure, uh, also known as reverse acting regulators. And droop uh, in a pressure regulating valve, in a BPRV we refer to that as pressure buildup. And Lyle's going to talk to that here in a couple of minutes. What can you expect from a BPRV? Accurate regulation. Again, that's a relative term. It's a the lower the cost, uh, the less accurate, generally speaking, the regulation is um, the higher the cost and the more sophisticated the product, the better regulation you'll get. Tight shutoff, again, that's a relative term. Uh, generally speaking, in back pressure regulating valves, you will see more often than not either class six in metal seated valves, or, or I'm sorry, in soft seated valves or class four where you have uh, a metal seat. Fast response, that's because the valve works off the, the line medium and responds very quickly. Minimum maintenance, generally speaking, uh, regulators are have simple designs, not a lot of uh, moving parts, so there's not a lot to go wrong. They're inherently quiet uh, in their operation. And because of the simplicity of the design, generally there is a low initial cost. The advantages of back pressure regulators, no external power is needed to position the valve, especially in a direct operated or self-operated uh, valve. The, no need for air, no need for electric. There's not even, uh, after you set the valve, there is not even a need for an operator. No need for separate measuring elements or feedback controllers. Again, these are pretty much set and forget products. Designs tend to be simple, providing low cost, high reliability, and easy maintainability. There's no stem packing, so that eliminates external leakage uh, and also eliminates a source of high friction. Back pressure regulators are in direct contact with a controlled variable and offer very fast response um, versus a control loop where it has to go through um, communication from one element to the next to the next. 
back pressure regulator limitations. The controlled medium must be relatively clean and benign as materials of construction are limited. Um, they're not as limited as they used to be. Uh, generally, most manufacturers will offer carbon, stainless, uh, ductile iron, cast steel, um, or bronze. Uh, some manufacturers will actually offer high alloys in addition to those. So um, clean is still very important. And when these are installed in line, most manufacturers will have um, a preferred installation schematic that comes along with the valve in the installation and maintenance guide, uh, which includes block valves on either side and strainers to make sure that the media is clean. BPRVs lose controllability when the pressure drop across the valve becomes small because the media cannot supply enough operating power. Operating points are not constant due to pressure buildup. BPRVs cannot accommodate anti-noise or cavitation trims, and failure, failure modes are fixed. Do not use a back pressure regulator when the desired pressure or temperature set point is beyond the range of the, reg of the regulator. It's pretty much a given process offset or in this case, pressure buildup cannot be tolerated. The pressure drop is extremely small or extremely great. When fail open is required, when the system requires control of a multivariable process, and with back pressure regulators, you're going to control pressure only. That's your choice. Uh, or when feedback is required. Here you see a, a cut section of a back pressure regulating valve. As we discussed earlier, um, the set point adjustment is handled through this adjustment screw. Again, if you turn it to the right, you'll compress the spring and raise your set point. Uh, if you back it off or turn it to the left, you'll relax the spring and your set point will go down. In a back pressure regulator, we're controlling P1. It, that is our controlled variable. And what happens is, is this is in the normally closed position. The, the springs are going to hold <clears throat> the valve in the normally closed position. The upstream pressure is sensed underneath the diaphragm. When it gets to the set point, it will start to compress the spring and allow the media to flow through. Okay, so the upstream pressure sensed beneath the diaphragm uh, and the, the force under the diaphragm opposes the, the spring force, so you have a force balance mechanism. And again, this can be used to relieve pressure or maintain pressure, um, either one. The, the P2 is generally, uh, we're not too worried, of, that's generally uncontrolled. Um, we're not really worried about that. We're, we're worried about controlling the upstream pressure. This is a standard back pressure regulator application. Uh, you have a pump. You have demand downstream. When that demand changes, for instance, um, you shut the demand off. Pressure starts to build. It continues to build up. It will come back to this normally closed back pressure regulator. When you meet or start to exceed the set point, the valve will open and relieve the pressure, thus preventing uh, damage, potential damage to your downstream piping or your pump. But that's a very basic, uh, very popular back pressure regulator application. Um, other typical back pressure regulator applications are in systems requiring control within 2 to 30%. And again, when we talk about the accuracy or the, um, you know, being within 2 to 30 percent of the set point, uh, that's when Lyle's going to come on and start to talk about pressure buildup. Um, there are a myriad of set and forget functions, pump bypass, like the application that we just looked at, return to tank, tank blanketing or, or D-padding. So when you have um, 
a tank with a nitrogen blanket. Um, a, a pressure regulating valve will be used on the inlet side. Back pressure regulating valve will be used on the outlet side. And so that will effectively be a D-pad valve. And also various other back pressure and relief functions. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. I'm Lyle Hamilton. Uh, welcome to the webinar. And we're going to talk about what causes inaccuracy in BPRVs. And the most important thing to remember going into this discussion is Harry went over with you uh, with the slide of the Mark 50, is that this is a proportional device. And think of it this way. As you're driving your car down the road, if the road is straight, you don't turn the wheel. You don't turn the wheel until the road starts to curve or you go off the road. A Mark 50, likewise, is going to stay closed until you just exceed your set point. So the, the definition in a proportional is, is that you've got to remember that there's no correction until there's an error. So you have to have the error occur first, and that's why you have some buildup in your pressure, and it doesn't always stay exactly at the set point. Now, let's look at some of the things that, de that determine what the uh, inaccuracy in a BPRV or the pressure build can be caused by. The deviation uh, from the set point increases proportionally to the flow to the regulator. In other words, for each amount of flow through that regulator, there's a specific percentage of seat opening associated with that pressure. That is the definition of proportional control. Now, what, what, uh, what uh, regulates or controls how much buildup you're going to have is first and foremost the stroke length. That's one of the reasons why the Jordan sliding gate has been so popular over the years is it has a very short stroke length compared to other valves. Also, the diaphragm area, remember the diaphragm is our sensor. The larger that diaphragm is, the more it reacts to subtle changes in pressure, so the larger the diaphragm, the more accurate it is. That's why you see our 51 series uh, in conjunction with the 50s, the 51 is the same, but it has a larger diaphragm, and it can provide finer control at lower set pressures because it is more able to react better. Spring rate. The lighter the spring, the more sensitive the valve is to small changes and the less buildup you get. And the thing to remember here is when you're ordering a valve for service, Let's say that you have, for instance, a set point of 50 PSI would be somewhat common. If your choices were, for instance, a 20 to 65 PSI range or a 40 to 130 range, I would recommend that you go with the 20 to 65 range because your desired set point of 50 PSI is higher in the specific range that in the first example than it is in the second. You want that set point to be as high as possible in the spring range, not on the low side. That enhances your accuracy and minimizes the pressure buildup that occurs as the flow increases. Okay, we're looking at this in graphical format. And as you see at the red X there, we have we have initiated a set point at a given rate of flow. And let's just keep the numbers round and say we've, been, we've, we've got a set point at 20 PSI at 50 GPM. Now, let's say that as uh, and we're using this, for instance, in a pump bypass application, and we need to take more water out of the system in order to keep pressure from building up. Well, since this is a proportional system, if we're going to get more flow or take flow out of that pump output and return it to the backside, the pressure has to go up. The reason being is the law of proportionality says that if we get the seats further open, we have to have more pressure to oppose the spring that keeps them closed. So as that flow increases, you'll see that there's a pressure buildup over set. Likewise, if the pressure starts falling below the set or the flow starts falling below the point at which the set point is established, you'll start to get the pressure dropping a little bit all the way down to the point to where the valve shuts off. Once again, this is just proportionality of 
control that you're going to see in any regulator. Remember in Regulators 101 we talked about it as droop, which is the pressure falling off. Since the spring acts to close the seats here in a back pressure regulator, we have the reverse effect. It builds up as the flow increases over that at which we took our set point, and it decreases as we go below the flow at which we established the set point. To correctly size a back pressure regulator, we need, some, we need the following information. Correctly size, uh, size valves are essential for accurate control. What we're going to need is the required flow capacity of the valve, if you, whatever the normal rate is. And if you've got min, max, and normal, that's great. We'll need the inlet pressure. That's your set point. That's the one that's really key here. The outlet pressure desired. And there can be some flow or restrictions of flow downstream of a Mark 50 that can cause downstream pressure. But a lot of times that pressure is going to be zero, so don't be surprised when you see that. We also need to know what the service is. Is it a water? Is it a thick liquid? Is it gas? Is it oil? Uh, the viscosity and specific gravity, if it's a liquid, that will go a long way into getting us to uh, helping us determine what the right CV or seat size for the valve is. Proper sizing, again, is essential. You see there uh, in the right-hand side a typical valve spec sheet. And again, the required information, first and foremost, the inlet pressure, P1. That's what we're setting the valve at. Outlet pressure, that's going to determine if we need any extra CV uh, or a larger seat to accommodate any flow resistance. The flow rate. Q, that's going to be obviously very important. We need to know how much we need to relieve from the system or take out of the system in order to hold that set point. And what's the medium? Is it oil? Is it water? Is it gas? Uh, desirable would be to have min, max, and normal flow, temperature of the, of the service for diaphragm selection, uh, what the service is, viscosity, specific gravity. The more information we have, the better we're able to size the valve the better we're able to size the valve, the more accuracy you're going to get, which means less buildup as that flow rate increases. Back pressure regulator valves are, of course, self-operated, and they work off the media pressure alone. If you remember back a few slides ago, Harry mentioned that some of the places where you might get a little wary of using a back pressure regulator over a dedicated control system is when the, back, when the pressure is set pressures are very low. Since that set pressure is what we rely on to actually operate the valve, if it gets too low, you might want to look at another option. You know, back pressure regulator valves hold the upstream to a desired set point, but there has to be some upstream pressure there to provide that necessary energy to operate the valve. The set point uh, on some back pressure regulators can be determined by a pilot. That would be your Mark 52 series and your Mark 57 series. And why would we use that? That would be a step up in cost, but when your set pressures start to get low, you know, or you've got requirements that you can't simply allow for a higher pressure buildup, using a pilot-operated valve can be the ticket to keep you into the self-powered regulator. And what a pilot does is it basically uses a small valve to sense the pressure, and then the output from the pilot controls the movement of a bigger valve. And what it does is, is it has a the most minimum uh, uh, buildup in pressure as flow increases. There may be a minimum set point that can be offered that is not subject to change. In other words, if we specify four or five PSI as the lowest uh, that pressure on our pilot, there's not much we can do to wiggle on that because we need that pressure to operate the valve. There we see a piloted regulator. You see the with the, uh, the smaller valve with the red dome is your pilot. Uh, what it does is it gives you larger line sizes for higher flows. It's much more accurate than a simple operated valve because it uses that pilot which the parts are very light, they're very sensitive to changes in pressure, and then what it does is it modulates upstream pressure into the actuator section of the main valve to open and close it. And in that way, you minimize the amount of pressure buildup that occurs as the valve needs to open further and further. 
there is a minimum downstream pressure. Uh, there's a minimum differential pressure requirement, i.e., a minute usually expressed in a minimum set point, and some models will require a downstream sensing tab. Again, the advantage, more accurate. Accuracy on a piloted regulator can sometimes rival a control system depending on your parameters. Less pressure buildup, more sensitive and, uh, as it has a higher gain. In other words, smaller changes in, in uh, the regulated upstream pressure can provide bigger changes in seat position. We call that gain. Uh, it can reduce your pressure buildup, but it can also be a disadvantage, especially if the valve is oversized. So that's why we stress to you, to two slides to do it, that the sizing is very important. You can get higher rangeability on a piloted regulator, 35 to 50 to 1, depending on system applications and media. Some disadvantages of the piloted regulator. Its, most, its biggest advantage could also be, uh, uh, on some occasions, uh, its, its weakness, the higher gain. If the gain is too high for the system, usually caused by uh, high differential pressures or oversizing of the main valve seats, uh, it can create oscillations. In other words, it will open too fast and then close back again, and you'll get a pulsating action. But that's also a major advantage. So again, sizing is important. Watching the differential pressure of these uh, applications is very important to get the advantages of that higher gain. Uh, it's not good for very fast, rapidly changing systems. And again, minimum pressure drops are required so that we have enough energy for the, for the pilot to operate the main valve for you. Moving uh, along uh, from the piloted regulator, our next option for you is the dome loaded PRV, and these are your 56 and 58 series. They eliminate the spring and use an air reference signal that's normally applied by a panel loader or an instrument air regulator, and that air signal creates a pressure on the top of the diaphragm, which, which replaces the spring. And so then your comparison of your controlled variable, which is upstream pressure, to your set point still occurs at the diaphragm. But instead of force provided by a spring and an adjusting screw, it's now the amount of pressure you've loaded in for a panel regulator. You can also use I to P's uh, if you've got an electronic controller on the system. Uh, these valves can give you, uh, at times, increased rangeability depending on the application. The low minimum DP requirement is, the, is an advantage here of the dome load of PRV. It does not have the minimum requirements as, that are as high as what you'd see on a piloted valve. And it's good for frequently changing set points or remote installations. Uh, let's say that you have a process where uh, depending on how many pumps you might be having in, in, in a process line or how many branches of flow that might be closing or opening as the day goes on, you might want to change your set point. This can be a good avenue for that. You can have a panel loading station where the operator can simply dial the set point, and that's ex especially advantageous if the valve happens to be up in the ceiling, inside a skid, or down in a pit where you don't want to send somebody down there with a wrench to, to operate that, that set screw. Tank blackening regulators. Normally, you'll see these on site and tell what they are. If you'll note, this one has a very large diaphragm, and it has an accommodation for what I like to call a lazy spring. It's a fairly long spring made out of thin wire to get lower set points. It's got very large, lightweight diaphragm to give you the increased sensitivity. Very light springs of low rate can get you with a set point as low as two inches of water column. These are used to take gases out of a tank. Examples here are when you're filling the tank and the eulage, which is the unused space in the tank, starts to decrease as the liquid level rises, that starts to compress your blanket gas, and you'll need to remove that gas. And if you don't want to vent it, out to atmosphere, you'll use a D-pad regulator to take that gas out, possibly send it back to a recovery system, scrub it, and reuse it. 
Another, uh, another instance where you use these is, for instance, as tanks are out in the sunlight and, and even with insulation as the sun bears down on these tanks, uh, the content temperature or the contents is going to increase. That's going to cause by the gas law the gas to expand and the pressure inside the tank will go up. This regulator can sense those small variations to take that gas out of there and keep the pressure in the tank where it ought to be. Our hierarchy here of accuracy is the self-operating or direct acting BPRV, again, 50, 51, mark 58. Normally you'll see a 10 to 30 percent pressure build as those valves operate over their normal range. Normally we like to size them around 50 percent of capacity to prevent the pressure build from going up over 30 percent of the set point. Advantages here. They're inexpensive, they can, they're a set and forget, and generally speaking can operate sometimes down to low pressures. Uh, given the case of the Mark 51, for instance, down as low as 2 to 3 PSI. Piloted BPRVs add, call, add some cost. Uh, the valve can have 5 to 10 percent of pressure build due to the fact that you've got that small pilot that can sense, that, those, sense those pressures and make minute changes and operate the main valve, which is much larger, to keep your pressure bills down. Uh, Air-loaded BPRVs eliminate the spring. You'll have a virtual zero pressure build, and they allow the use of extended range I2P so that you can control via a 4 to 20. Uh, since it's a force balance mechanism, it's going to respond pretty quick. Uh, control as compared to your typical pressure transmitter, control valve, uh, and controller setup. Also you have the uh, advantage of remote operation as we discussed. The valve can be deep inside a machine, way up in the ceiling, down in a pit, and an operator can just walk by a control station and change the set pressure as needed. So how do you choose? Self-operated regulators, 10 to 30 percent bill, 10 to 1 rangeability. If that's okay, that's your ticket. And and you know this may sound like that's uh, 10 to 30 is is a lot, but that that's very acceptable in a lot of applications and, and a lot of opportunities to sell the 50, the 51, and the 58. If the customer says, "Look, I can't go up that high, but I can tolerate 10 percent." And I need and you can and you need more rangeability of control, i.e., your your maximum divided by your minimum flow is much higher. Then you can go with a pilot operated uh, BPRV. Uh, that will give you the uh, the rangeability and the sensitivity you need. Uh, the main uh, uh, things to remember when choosing between self operated and pilot operated is that. Pilot operated valves will have higher accuracy and higher capacity, whereas your self operated BPRV will have the higher speed of response and the lower cost. So in summary, a back pressure regulator, if you properly size it and properly apply it to the application, can provide dependable and accurate regulation and a fast response with low noise and a minimum maintenance. We've had some sliding gate regulators go on in service for 10, 20, 30 years. You'll never see that out of a control valve or a control system. Not to mention the cost of operating those is zero since they operate on process pressure. Okay, uh, we've reached the end now and uh, ready to take a few questions. Harry and Lyle, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, we're going to take questions, so please type them into the, uh, the question tool. If for some reason you have a question that you can't get into that question tool, uh, please feel free to give us a call. Um, if you don't know your account manager, just feel free to ask for me and I'll, I'll get you taken care of. Okay, uh, while we're waiting for some to come in, we do have one uh, that came in uh, in writing to, uh, to Lesman yesterday from Kerry, and the question is, is that what considerations should be used to specify back pre pressure regulators for use in pro uh, protecting uh, magnetic 
pumps with an electromagnetic coupling between the motor and the impeller against a deadhead pressure. This is a uh, great application for using Mark 50s and 51s. De depend what what you're going to is going to depend on how much pressure you you need uh, for your initial opening. In other words, how much deadhead pressure can that can that uh, magnetic drive pump take? Uh, if it can't take very much, you need to start looking probably at your Mark 51 product there or the Mark 58 product. They can operate generally below 5 PSI fairly well. The next question is how much fluid are you going to need to relieve from that, of that pump's output to recirculate back to the inlet of the pump or back to the tank in order to, to keep it from going up? So. To answer the question, the, the primary thing we're need, going to need to know is how much deadhead can that pump take? In other words, what's the set point? When do we want this valve to open to start to relieve fluid out of the process to go back to the inlet side of the pump or back into the tank? The second thing we need to know, how much are we going to have to take away? Once we know those two things, then we can steer you into the right regulator and configure it, and configure it so that you can uh, expect the performance that you're going to need. Uh, we have product configurators, product designators that are available to less than salespeople to help you do that. We also have them online on our website on the back pages of our literature. All right, we've got a couple more questions that have come in. And uh, please, if you have a question, feel free to type it in as we're answering these others. Uh, first question I have here is, do you have process diaphragm for the typical uses of each BR, B, BPRBs like you presented with the pump pressure bypass? Uh, as far as, well, I'm not, I'm not quite clear on that. Uh, generally speaking, okay. pump pressure bypass, diaphragm selection basically is a two is a, is a two-step process. First and foremost, we need to know what the media is because we want to make sure that the diaphragm that we're going to select is compatible. We offer stainless steel, Buna N, EPDM, Viton, and a material called Jorlon, which is a polymeric, very flexible polymeric material that has the uh, inertness or the resistance okay. Uh, of Teflon when it comes to chemical action. Once we know that, we can then say this group of materials is acceptable, this group is not. And then within that subgroup, what's the set point? Some materials are more flexible and more applicable to lower set points, some more applicable to higher set points. So to answer that All question, right. the first thing we need well, to do, what is it? Ryan, Ryan has the, the questioner, Ryan, has pointed out that my dyslexia kicked in. <laughs> and the question is really, do you have a process diagram for the typical uses, like you presented with the pump pressure bypass? A process diaphragm? I, or diagram. Di diagram. Oh, yeah, diagram. A drawing. OK. OK. Uh, we do have some diagrams available yeah. uh, that we can, we can furnish uh, via Lesman. Yes, we do. So we'll, we'll get those over to Ryan so that he's got them. OK. The next question is, any recommendations for a fluid with some particulate present? You know, you, it's, it's one of those things that you, you just have to be very careful. Lyle likes to say, and he's incredibly accurate when he says so, that uh, a regulator or a back pressure regulator is an awfully expensive strainer. Um, we have done um, applications with entrained solids before, but this is certainly not a, a, a valve made for uh, slurry service or solid service <laughs> in any way. So it goes to um, the, the size of the particulates and the amount. Um, that is entrained in the in the fluid stream. So that would be on an application by application basis. Again, we, we look primarily at clean service uh, for both regulators and back pressure regulating valves. But we, we have done um, slurries or 
applications within trained solids in the past. Some very successfully, one of the first ones I got involved with was in rapeseed oil over in the UK, um, which is flaxseed, I believe. But uh, and it and it had you know quite a bit of particulate in it, and and we successfully applied a back pressure regulator in in that particular service, and it's been working now for uh, about seven years. So. It's it's a case by case basis, and so we you know we'll take a look at them. Um, the the problem that you run into is if you get if you get solids uh, behind the seat in a sliding gate style valve or uh, stuck between the plug and the seat in a globe style valve, it, you're going to have you're going to have leakage and and run the risk of potentially damaging the the uh, seat. Okay, very good. We don't have any more questions, so uh, I'll start to wrap it up. And if another question comes in before we're uh, we're done here, I'll we'll, I'll go ahead and get it in. One thing I'll, I'll want elaborate. To... Uh, one thing I like to elaborate on uh, what Harry said was that on some uh, some applications, uh, the, he as he mentioned the size of the particles, how many, how hard are they? Uh, on certain. Uh, applications where we've met the three criteria that I just mentioned and decided we're going to go ahead with it. We also have what we call a GP option available on both the Mark 50 and the Mark 60 that puts flush ports uh, where particles can collect in a regulator and when the process goes down you can inject steam or some other uh, dissolving media or solvent into the valves and key places to flush those particles out and downstream and then restart the system. But again, all the cautions that Harry prescribed need to be evaluated and uh, uh, before we can even talk about offering you a GP valve. Are there uh, any particulate size limitations that you can talk to? I mean, is there a particulate, you know? No, it's really size? kind of a kind of a figure. It's a kind of a as a push pull among the three different variables that, that Harry outlined. Size, uh, how many of them are in a specific volume of fluid, and how hard are they? Uh, you know, as one of those increases, something else has to give. Hardness is kind of absolute. I really don't want to see anything that, that's really hard, like for, uh, metal fines, for instance, uh, not good. Uh, you know, if this is uh, like dissolved food material, uh, that's probably okay. Um, sometimes water so, with uh, like chalk or clay deposits like dolomite in there, that's okay. But it, it's a case-by-case -case evaluation and that's where, you know, I would work with somebody uh, from Lessman to get with the customer to get that information and then make a decision on A, whether or not to proceed and then B, what the configuration would be. Okay, so we have a specific example that just came in. Okay. 0 .8, 0 0.8 micron on average, 1 to 2 percent. It will dissolve when heated, but condenses as it cools. Okay, great. Perfect application for a, a 50 GP. And uh, basically, as long as those solids stay dissolved during the heat and would just tend to collect in the... Uh, in the in, in some of the crevice areas of the valve, I'd say that would be an application for a 50 GP. And as if the process got a little cool and you started to get a little particle collection, uh, you could always temporarily isolate the valve, flush it, and then put it back into operation. Okay. So he says other or asks are there temperature limitations? And that depends on the, on the configuration. For instance, if you're going, let's say, let, let's go and say you had a set point of, say, that's maybe 10 PSI, and you wanted minimum build, and I say, okay, we're going to go with, uh, just for instance, a Viton diaphragm. That's going to be subject to the limits of the Viton diaphragm, which is probably going to be somewhere around 350 or so. Uh, if you've got a high set point, let's say 150 PSI, we put you in a metal diaphragm. Uh, and with our standard drawer code seats, temperature could be uh, well up over 100. Uh, what was the last number? Because it, it cut out. 400 to 550 okay. degrees, approaching the maximum. Uh, but 
you could have temperatures uh, that can go up a couple hundred degrees depending on what what other co considerations we have to take uh, for the process. For instance, like I said, lower set point, we'd want to go more toward an elastomer diaphragm, which is going to have a lower maximum temperature. Higher set points, we go with a stainless steel that has higher maximum temperature allowances. Okay, great. That, that answers the question. Uh, we don't have any further questions, so uh, if you do want to know more about the technologies we, su we supply, please follow us on some of the social media. Uh, if you're not a follower on Dan's blog, it's, it's very active and offers tons of great tips. Uh, all of our webinars are posted both to our website under the Learning Center and also to uh, Lessman Instrument on YouTube. Uh, if you want to know when something is posted, you can uh, follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter. Next month, our webinar topic will be presented by Lessman's own A.J. Piscor. Uh, A.J. is our combustion and control specialist. A.J. is going to discuss design considerations of combustion fuel uh, pipe trains to meet the uh, National Fire Protection Association requirements, or NFPA. This webinar, webinar will be held on February 18th. Announcements will be coming out shortly. Uh, at this point, I don't have any further questions. So our presentation will conclude. Thank you for attending. And Harry and Lyle, thanks again for your presentation. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Thanks for everybody's attention. We appreciate it.